Uh, well, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Storsley. I'm the executive director of the Constitutional Law Center. Uh, and it's uh, my privilege uh, to welcome you on behalf of Michael McConnell, the director of the center, uh, to tonight's constitutional conversation, the first of the academic year. Um, so tonight's conversation is about uh, the internal sort of dispute resolution processes of religious uh, groups, how uh, various religious communities organize themselves to resolve disputes within their communities. Um, for some of us, I think maybe who uh, didn't grow up in a community like that, the idea of law is like an idea that sort of a, we have a rule that resolves disputes for everyone. Um, but of course, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, the oldest kinds of law are the kinds uh, about religious communities resolving disputes among themselves. Uh, and in fact, this scenario of law is becoming increasingly important. Uh, I'll let Professor Broy speak to that, but I'll, I'll just say uh, one thing about that. Uh, one of the more uh, sort of interesting and important Supreme Court decisions about the religion clauses in recent years was a case called Hosanna Tabor versus EEOC. And in that case, the Supreme Court concluded that both the free exercise clause and the establishment clause protect the right of religious communities to govern themselves um, in certain specific instances. Uh, one of those instances being sort of legal disputes between the ministers of a religious organization uh, and, and their congregants. Um, so this is a really important issue. Um, the sort of implications of that decision are in many ways yet to be determined, but this is a cutting edge area of law and one that's very important uh, to a lot of religious communities. So we're very excited to have Professor Broy uh, talk to us about that today. Just a few words of introduction um, for our speaker tonight. So Michael Broy uh, is a professor at Emory Law School uh, and a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University, um, one of the sort of premier places in the country uh, where folks are thinking about and working on these issues. Um, he writes and teaches regularly in law and religion, uh, Jewish law and ethics, uh, family law, uh, and a variety of other topics. Um, he's an ordained rabbi, uh, as well as an accomplished legal scholar having published, I think, 75 uh, various law review articles or articles dealing with law and religion in one uh, way or another. Um, his most recent book, which I'd encourage you to check out uh, if you haven't seen it or heard about it yet, is called Sharia Tribunals, uh, Rabbinical Courts, and Christian Panels, Religious Arbitration in America and the West. And this is a really interesting study of sort of the different kinds of uh, dispute resolution procedures that many religious communities engage in. I'll let Professor Broyd speak about that in more detail. but. It's, Really interesting. It's really our privilege to have you. So please join me in welcoming uh, Michael Broy. Thank you all so much. It's really a, a, a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Mark, for all your hard work in organizing. I know how difficult it is to organize not just the lecture, but such a fantastically, um, wonderfully dinner. It smells really, really, really good. Um, I've learned not to eat before I speak unless more than words come out of my mouth. And so I'll try to stick with that rule here. Um, religious communities of any substantive type make the following deep decision up front. Are they content to be a minority religion in society? Or are they only going to function as a majoritarian religion? Um, religions that decide that they're only going to be majoritarian religions are driven out of and leave societies where they can't control the law. The Jewish tradition, from whence I come, a long time ago, decided it was going to be a diasporic tradition. It was, for 2,000 years, almost exclusively a minority diasporic tradition. And yet, it did not give up on the doctrine of law not only didn't it give up on the doctrine of law, it doubled down and insisted that there was something called Jewish law, which it would seek to make binding on people who identified with the Jewish community. Um, this model of diasporic law, of course, gives rise to enforcement mechanism problems, which is it's nice to have law, but unless it has teeth, it's not really law. So for countless centuries, the Jewish community lived throughout its many different places. Um, although it was in a diaspora, they were creating many governments. Within the ghetto walls of most European cities, Jewish law governed in some form within the ghetto. 
And even though it was a diaspora community, there was a law. And the law was Jewish law, and it was enforced by the Jewish tribunals. In medieval Spain, the Jewish courts executed people. But even if you look into more modern times, the Jewish community in Warsaw, until the Nazi invasion in 1939, had its own police force, which carried guns and enforced a version of Jewish law, albeit modified by the fact that Poland was a Western, albeit non-democratic, government. Um, the challenge of Jewish law in America is about how does one run a diaspora community in a Western democracy? And to a great extent, the, the question that I want to address to you here is what lessons can be learned from the Jewish experience in America and how it can be applied to and by other cultures. Mark told me this could be more of a TED talk than a lecture. So when you ask my mother what she's most proud of me, she says, my son not only serves on a rabbinical court, but he's the advisor to two Islamic courts in the United States as well. Part of my role is I advise religious tribunals of almost any type how to take advantage of the wonderful developments in the United States with regard to arbitration law that allows um, Christian panels, I serve as an advisor to a couple of Christian panels as well, um, Sharia tribunals, Jewish law courts, each of which is trying to take the Jewish lesson in the United States and adopt it and modify it and apply it to life in the United States. Here's the quick summary for those of you who have only a little bit of patience or who want to leave in just a few minutes. <laughs> the Federal Arbitration Act of 1925, even though the writers of the act didn't see this coming, validated religious arbitration in the United States. And they more or less passed a congressional act which is binding on the states and states have struggled to bypass unsuccessfully, which more or less says as follows, parties can choose to opt out of litigation by signing a contract of arbitration, which can both give them a choice of law and a choice of forum. By this I mean as follows, if you and I have a dispute about a matter, and we are both residents of New York, we can decide that we are not going to have our dispute resolved by the courts in the state of New York, and we're not going to have this dispute resolved according to New York state law. Even though Justice Cordoza, writing on the New York Court of Appeals, screams in 1907 against this model, he says, how can you do this? New York state law is true, and its justices are, are obviously doing the right thing. We shouldn't let people opt out by contract from New York law, maybe Pennsylvania law by contract, but New York law never because it's truth incarnate. The Federal Arbitration Act allows parties to identify an alternative legal code and an alternative forum for resolving their disputes. Now the, side, the writers of the Federal Arbitration Act thought this would mean deference to one state over another, Pennsylvania instead of New York, or maybe even they imagined it would be French law on occasion. But actually, it's been widely understood for many years, and particularly since the Supreme Court has vigorously expanded arbitration in the last 30 years to mean we can agree to any legal system, and we can agree to virtually any tribunal. So what this means practically is you and I can have a dispute, and we can agree to have our dispute resolved by a religious tribunal that will adjudicate this dispute in accordance with its religious principles. Or by the way, we could have a dispute about a commercial matter, and we could write in our arbitration agreement that we wish to have our dispute resolved in accordance with Italian law, but only by Polish-speaking jurists. <laughs> located in San Antonio. How come? Because we agreed. 
That's what the Federal Arbitration Act says. Two people who agree to parameters for resolving their dispute should feel free to resolve their dispute in accordance with Italian law as understood by Polish jurists residing in San Antonio, Texas. And if you don't want your dispute resolved that way, you have a very simple remedy. Don't sign the binding arbitration agreement. If you sign it, you're bound by it. Starting in about 1960, the rabbinical courts began to realize that they could hear disputes in accordance with Jewish law in front of a, rabbin a rabbinic arbitration tribunal. This gave rise to an organization called the Beth Din of America, which hears and resolves countless disputes in accordance with Jewish law. And it went through a learning curve, because what quickly developed is judges said, we're only going to affirm these decisions if we can understand them and examine them for procedural due process. Since you're all law students, you understand where we go from here. Procedural due process doesn't mean we've examined substantive Jewish law and we find it to be correct. Not at all. Nor we've examined substantive Jewish law and we found it to be fair. Not at all. What it means instead is in order to get a rabbinical court decision adhered to, you have to follow certain procedural rules, like no hearings on federal holidays. Like, um, you have to allow parties to bring their attorneys in. Like, you have to allow certain kinds of cross-examination of witnesses. Like, you can't torture people to get them to testify. All sorts of obvious things that you would have intuited, or a glance at the statute would have told you that you can't do this. But what judges are not allowed to do under the Federal Arbitration Act is examine whether the arbitrators applied the right legal rule, either in the sense of consistent with American law or even more prohibitive, um, correctly understanding Jewish law. They're not allowed to do either of those things. All we have here is procedural due process rules. Did you follow the minimal procedures required under the Federal Arbitration Statute? Did you take a bribe from a litigant? If you took a bribe from a litigant, then you know what? The arbitration is not enforceable. Did you speak to the litigants in English? Did you schedule court hearings at 2 in the morning? Did you provide ample notice to the parties? Basic rules of procedural justice are applicable. But the substantive conversations, like do you accept the Uniform Commercial Code, um, or any other substantive rules of American law, these are absolutely weighed by the parties by dint of the fact that they agreed to adjudicate according to Jewish law. By the way, in that sense, Jewish law is no different from French law or Italian law, which also has provisions in it that flagrantly violate American law, writ big. But the whole purpose of the Federal Arbitration Act is to allow you and me to enter into a contract of arbitration um, in which we agree on substantively different rules. As long as we both agree, um, everything works out just fine. Um, this has led to constant cases within the Jewish community. The rabbinical court system is thriving and functioning. There's one in Los Angeles. There's an attempt to start one in San Francisco that uh, failed. But there are rabbinical courts scattered throughout the land uh, run by a variety of people. I served as a director of a rabbinical court for a year while I was on sabbatical from Emory many years ago. And I served as a rabbinical court judge for almost 20 years in the Beth Din of America, hearing cases all the time. What kinds of cases? Financial disputes. End of marriage disputes. There are almost no um, getting married disputes. Child custody disputes. I hear lots and lots of child custody disputes between parties. Child custody is a little bit different because it's subject to some sort of de novo review since it's an in rem proceeding. But my experience with child custody disputes is important to share. I've heard about 100 of them. 
Um, how many times have I been reversed? None. Now, I know in my heart of hearts that this is because I'm the smartest guy in the world, <laughs> and I never get it wrong. So the judges have closely looked at every case I've ever issued a decision on and said, oh yes, Roy got it right again. But I hold out the smidgen of another possibility. The other possibility is judges confuse the Latin term de novo with the Latin term pro forma. <laughs> um, and they don't know quite the difference between the two of them. They look at the first line or two of my decision, which say, I'm Michael Broyd, I'm a law professor at Emory, I teach family law, and I'm doing this analysis um, as part of my rabbinical court duties, and here's what I think is in the best interest of the child. And the judge then takes out his red stamp, which says, I have undertaken a thorough and complete de novo review of this matter, and I affirm. And then he stamps it, and that's called a de novo review. I can't really explain to you how every single decision I've ever issued has been uh, affirmed under a de novo review, other than the possibility that I adhere to, which is I'm the smartest guy in every room I enter into, or my wife's possibility. My wife says the reason why this is the case is they don't really read what you write. They just affirm without examining. Um, and this has given rise, by the way, now to a variety of other religions that are doing this. As the evangelical Christian community in America retreats from its previous posture, 30 years ago, the evangelical Christian community maintained that it was going to fight to make secular law in the United States reflect its values. And they were not going to retreat, they were going to assert ownership. And when questions of law came up in matters that the evangelicals had a dog in this fight, they let their dogs loose and they won the fight. This was the informal reality in the United States in communities where there were significant evangelical communities. In the last 15 years, it's become clear that the evangelical Christian community has lost. Um, Same-sex marriage uh, has caused them to walk away from large amounts of family law, which was previously an area that they fought diligently on, and they are withdrawing to run arbitration tribunals just like the Jewish community, in which they seek to enforce their own values. The single biggest value that the evangelical Christian community seeks to enforce is they seek to enforce fault for marital misconduct so that there's a financial penalty associated with engaging in marital misconduct. And they write prenuptial agreements that give them jurisdiction, and they even sometimes write postnuptial agreements in which the parties consent that should there be a dispute, they agree to be adjudicated in front of the Peacemakers Network or some other comparable evangelical network within the United States, and they've been moderately successful. It takes a certain amount of dual training people to actually get it right. You have to produce people who are well vested in your religious system while simultaneously going to law school, and they're slowly developing a network of this. The Sharia tribunals have had a much bumpier time for a variety of reasons, one of which is um, Sharia naturally gives rise to a certain amount of social hostility in a segment of the community. It's also true that the Islamic community has even many fewer dual-trained people who are comfortably vested in Sharia law while simultaneously vested in American law so that they can write these judicial opinions, these opinions as arbitrators that secular judges read at and approve without significant thought. And, of course, there's a great deal of political opposition to the term uh, Sharia law in any form. Uh, when I published this book, Oxford said to me, put the word Sharia first and you'll sell some copies. <laughs> you put the word rabbinical first, you'll sell three copies, two of whom will be bought by your mother. Um, you put Sharia first, everybody will buy. Um, and it's turned out to be true, by the way. That's a sort of interesting, reminds you not to argue with the experts. But it's important to understand that the Islamic courts will eventually get this right. Right now, they're stuck employing people like me to give them advice. Uh, but over time, um, they'll find people who are deeply vested in Sharia law while simultaneously products of excellent law schools like Emory. Because <laughs> uh, they're going to watch it on camera. Emory. Uh, Stanford also 
also Stanford. Um, and um, this will give rise to a collection of people who will allow the Islamic courts to be as successful as the Jewish courts are in enforcing their will on the community that voluntarily agrees to them. The central question is, is this a good idea? Should we modify the Federal Arbitration Act to prevent this from happening? Now, of course, you can't modify the Federal Arbitration Act just to exclude Sharia law. That would give rise to all sorts of establishment clause problems. But there are many things you could do to get religious tribunals out of the business of being granted rights under the Federal Arbitration Act. I guess I'm sort of here going to review the pluses and minuses with you for 10 or so minutes. And then I'm going to conclude in favor of religious arbitration to explain to you why I think in the biggest of pictures it's a good idea. Um, many European countries have substantially eliminated religious arbitration. They do it in a very simple way, <coughs> very un-American, but very simple. They say French law shall apply all the time in all disputes. And they deny choice of law. In France, I think the rule is, is that you can't engage in arbitration not consistent with French law unless you're a corporation and the amount in dispute is more than $5 million. But I might have gotten those details wrong. But it's important to understand that one way to do this is to say there's one law for one people. Everybody shall use our legal system. Why doesn't the state of Georgia do that to get rid of religious tribunals? Nobody wants to do business in accordance with Georgia law. Many significant commercial activities are done according to <coughs> New York law or British maritime law. One law for one people is a basic inconsistency with the American model in which many, many, many people have choice of law provisions on a variety of activities. Sears doesn't want to do business in Atlanta, Georgia in accordance with Georgia law. It wants to have a choice of law provision that makes reference to some other jurisdiction in some other way. So even though many European countries have moved to the one law to, for one people rationale, America is the weakest place. We are a federalized jurisdiction where at any given transaction, multiple laws possibly could apply. So one law for one people is, is a dog to begin with. Another possibility is, is that religious law produces substantive injustices. And that what we really want to do here is start enforcing substantive law on religious arbitration tribunals. And when religious arbitration tribunals start veering from American law, um, we ought to cut them down. The problem with this, of course, is we have no notion of substantive injustice in the United States. If you take this seriously, then you say you have to apply the law of a specific jurisdiction. If you don't take it seriously, then it's hard to distinguish between Jewish law and French law. Can I waive my right to a jury in arbitration? The answer is you've got to. But what about the fact that the Constitution gives me the right to a trial by jury? The answer is we don't have strong doctrines in the United States of substantive injustice. The way you curtail substantive injustice of the most severe type is you limit religious arbitration tribunals to matters that can be um, turned into money. So of course, when uh, a religious tribunal says, a plaintiff shall poke out defendant's eye in retribution, of course that's not enforceable. We limit the substantive matters to matters that can be codified into money. Although my own experience as an arbitrator is, is that if you can control the money, you can always get people to do what you want them to do because money is very important. You can do heightened procedural inquiries. And of course, there's some truth to the fact that arbitration tribunals of religious types tend to live with uh, a greater number of procedural irregularities um, than, you other, <coughs> excuse me, than you otherwise would find in, let's say, American Arbitration Association arbitrations. But the truth is, is that as time passages, passes, religious arbitrators get better and better at procedural conformity as more and more dual system people come in, they learn to dot the I's and cross the T's and not engage in activity. One of the things I do as a sideline is I read in advance um, rabbinical court decisions. They ask me if I'll read them to determine if I think they're enforceable. So as you focus on procedural injustices, you hire enough people to help you dot the I's and cross the T's correctly. 
The hardest issue, of course, is that religious communities coerce people into signing arbitration agreements. How do they do this? They say if you don't sign an arbitration agreement, you can't be a member of our community. That's what they do. I do this. When I do a wedding at Rabbi Droid, I say to people, here's a prenuptial agreement. If you won't sign this prenuptial agreement, I won't do your wedding. And they say, but we don't want to sign your prenuptial agreement, to which I say, great, don't sign it, but I don't want to do your wedding. And they say, but Rabbi Broy, shouldn't you respect our free choice? To which I say, sure, I respect your free choice by walking away. Now, when enough of us agree to walk away consistently, it becomes coercive. And by the way, you can make it even harsher. You can say, not only must you use my prenup, but if you find a rabbi who will do your wedding without my prenup, you're not welcomed into my synagogue. And the Catholic Church has done this for a long time. They say, if you don't do this, if you adopt this view, you're not eligible to take communion. Please don't come to church anymore. Religions have associational rights. I don't find this coercive. I find this to be part of the freedom the Constitution has given religions. But I recognize others find this aspect coercive. Of course, occasionally you have situations where people are coerced through tasers or physical force. And of course, the law has to react to those by arresting and confining people. But as a general proposition, the idea that we run a religious community, and if you don't adhere to our religious norms, including signing an arbitration agreement at the right moment, you're welcome to leave our community, strikes me as an associational right that we give people. We give churches, we give religion. In the land of American individualism, people grade on this. And they say, no, no, no. I ought to have the right to attend your synagogue and defy you. But um, I've been a synagogue rabbi, I'm no longer, but I was for many years. And I would explain to people that, ha ha, you can't do that. I will call the police as the CEO and accuse you of trespassing if you don't leave the building when I command you to leave the building. That's my right as the CEO of this organization. I've done that on occasion. One famous incident involved a person who was in an overt adulterous relationship, who I said, don't come to synagogue until you stop your overt relationship. And when he came to synagogue, I stood at the pulpit and I said, worship will stop until this person leaves. Somebody should call the police now to say we have a trespasser. They should please come to the building to arrest the trespasser. So he left. Um, these are associational rights. I don't have the obligation to worship in a synagogue with somebody whose conduct I find repulsive. It's an associational right. Others find that very, very, very complicatingly coercive. Um, Working in the background of this, of course, is the problem of religious freedom rights, which is people say, I signed this arbitration agreement, and I believed in Jewish law or Islamic law or canon law at the time that I signed it. But you know what? I no longer believe. And it's coercive of my religious obligations to make me sign a, uh, uh, obey a contract that requires I make a religious appearance. That argument also, I think, is weak in the United States, where we have very elaborate contract doctrines that allow you to surrender your First Amendment rights contractually. So I think the idea that um, you, if you sign a contract that requires you engage in this specific activity and it has religious overtones and you signed it and you got consideration, you sort of waived your First Amendment rights. But the core of the objection, I think, is the following objection. There's a distinct risk <coughs> excuse me, that religious tribunals will encourage the hermitized ceiling of religious communities, they'll form their own box and not welcome outsiders in. And this will further compartmentalize religious life and will decrease the melting pot that is the, the sign, the sin quo non, the very structure of American society. And the biggest risk with religious tribunals is their further strength in the rules and the walls and the insularity of fundamental, fundamentalist religious communities, encouraging people to build communities that are insular and independent of the secular law. Because if we all sign arbitration agreements, we all live on our communes, we'll all live lives that look like the Hutterite brothers in northern Minnesota. God should save us from northern Minnesota. It's very cold. Um, I guess, I think that my perspective goes as follows. 
I think that religious arbitration is, at its heart, a very good thing. I think so for five reasons. I think it's a religious freedom imperative. I think that basically the Supreme Court got it right in the Good News case. In Good News, the Supreme Court said, you can't provide rights to everybody and exclude religion. If you're going to rent out classrooms to everybody and anybody, then you have to rent them out to churches because they're part of the everybody and everybody. And then you can't exclude religion from the common will of good ideas that are available. If you say you can arbitrate according to any religious law, according to any law, you shouldn't be able to say, but not religious law. You shouldn't be able to say that. And you shouldn't be able to say that either explicitly or implicitly by putting requirements in place that substantially exclude anybody connected to a religion. Secondly, and more importantly, experientially, I found that religious arbitration does a better job resolving co-religionous disputes. People frequently opt for religious arbitration because they think religious arbitrators understand what's really going on in their community or in their mind or in their commerce. When I'm selling you a product and I use certain words, it's true, secular courts can determine what the words kosher really mean. But it's easier to go to a rabbinical court that understands darn well what the word kosher means. And not only do they understand it, what it, it's in a technical sense, they understand what the typical kosher consumer considers kosher, which is not always accurately reflected in the books. Uh, Co-religion commerce is hard for secular courts to adjudicate because it puts them in unfamiliar territory. I have no doubts that they're constitutionally empowered to do this. I just think that they do a lousy job because it requires that they determine foreign law. When I was clerking a long time ago with Judge Garth, he asked me the following question in my first day of office. He said, as you swear as a clerk to obey the law and the Constitution of the United States, why don't you swear to obey the law of the various states whose law we're also enforcing? I thought it was a very fascinating question. We enforce state law all the time. Why don't I swear to uphold the law of the state of New Jersey? And Judge Garth looked at me, smiled, and said, we're federal judges. We don't understand a thing about New Jersey law. <laughs> now, if you think Judge Garth doesn't understand a thing about New Jersey law, a legal system he practiced in for 70 years, died only at the age of 95, um, imagine what Judge Garth would say about Jewish law. Meaning it's hard to get into a legal system that's really foreign to you. Um, arbitrators within their system do a better job than even the most competent of, of, religious, uh, of secular arbitrators. Related to this, of course, is that secular religious arbitrators sometimes can solve problems that secular courts are simply not empowered to solve because there are unique problems of religion that are just beyond the ken of judges, like the giving and receiving of a Jewish divorce or a variety of other problems determining whether a priest or an imam has engaged in religious misconduct is almost beyond the ken of a secular legal system. But much more importantly, I don't agree with the fundamental critics of religious arbitration. My experience has been that religious arbitration and the secular review process that follows it heightens the integration of religious communities. I'll give you a basic rule that I've learned. Nobody likes to be reversed. Being reversed sucks. I remember many years ago, I heard Jack Weinstein say something. He said, look, I don't really care if the Second Circuit reverses me. If they reverse me, they're all idiots. But most district court judges and court of appeals judges I know hate being reversed. Nobody likes being reversed. None of the religious arbitrators I ever speak to like being reversed when they go in front of a secular court for review. So what do they do to avoid this reversal? They integrate enough secular law into their religious arbitration, and they become familiar with the values and models of secular law. So it doesn't become a compartment. It becomes a compartment with many holes. It becomes a situation in which you know fully well as a religious arbitrator, the losing litigant is going to file a brief in secular court saying this religious decision should be vacated because of this, 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 and this. And you know what they're going to say because it's pretty predictable. And you learn to integrate secular values in, and you learn not to do certain things that Jewish law permits you to do because you know 
that your secular judge who's reviewing you will not permit you to do this. And what happens is an elaborate dance. It's an elaborate dance. Secular courts provide feedback to religious arbitration tribunals as to what they need to do. The religious arbitration tribunals try their hardest to adhere to this and then are subject to review another time. And this dance goes on with many, many, many different values being shared. And it's important to understand that if you don't allow this and you simply don't permit any religious arbitration, religious arbitration doesn't cease. It just goes underground. And when it goes underground, there's no limitations on what can or cannot be done, because it's not subject to any secular review. It's only subject to ecclesiastical religious review. Whereas if you say, if you adhere to the procedural rules of American law, you will be granted enforcement through a sheriff, and you'll have substantive rights at play, religious court judges say, I want that and I need that. What do I have to do to get that? And they do that. And that is an extremely tempering insight for religious tribunals. Experientially, I've seen this in Jewish courts. I've seen this in evangelical Christian courts. And I've seen this in Sharia courts as well. Everybody wants to be enforced by secular court. And they don't do things that secular courts won't let them do. And they modify their substantive religious doctrines in order to accommodate the needs of secular <coughs> law, of course, all the time. And it occurs in a variety of different ways in financial law, in family law, and in ritual law itself. It gets modified in order to grab the enforcement of secular law. And I'll share with you what else I think is happening. Um, this process, over time, provides judges with insights into what's going on in the religious mind, and maybe sometimes allows American law to look at another legal system and learn <coughs> something from it. The dialogue goes both ways. I've testified countless times in secular court about Jewish law proceedings, and every once in a while, I affect the judge. judges. Judges are stubborn and hard to change their mind. But every once in a while, they encounter something in a foreign legal system, and you know what they say? Gee, that's really neat and interesting. And then I'll see a judicial opinion of theirs, and they'll bring it in, as the Supreme Court did in the Miranda case, where it drops a footnote talking about forced confessions in Jewish law. It's not unknown that legal systems will look at religious law. The process of reviewing religious tribunals runs in two directions. Judges talk to religious arbitrators, and they help them grow. And sometimes religious arbitrators talk to judges and help them grow. To me, ultimately, that's the single most important value that religious arbitration contributes to the United States. What we have here is another manifestation of pluralism in the real world. What happens in religious arbitration is these two systems interact, learn, and grow from each other, and produces a more prosperous, successful, more diverse American legal society. That's the goal of um, religious arbitration when well done. It not only makes religious communities more American, it makes American communities more exposed to religious ideas and ideals. And ultimately, that will validate and improve both societies. Thank you very much. They say there's Q&A. Thanks so much, Professor Broyd. So uh, as is our custom, we'll do questions at the microphone. If you have a question, please just come down and ask. Are we on? OK. Um, how have secular courts treated the coercion argument? Not the taser coercion, but more like the soft coercion. Have they found that to be valid to get out of an arbitration agreement? Or yes. The courts have, with near uniformity, um, permitted what they call an excommunication, which is you may not participate in our community 
unless you sign such agreements, and that's not thought of as coercive. I'll go even further. I think that that's a protected associational right under the Constitution. You can't require a church to let somebody in and worship in a church when the church says, we don't want that person here for religious reasons. Thank you. Uh, just, to, I guess, a quick question about the elaborate dance between church and state that you mentioned. One of the rationales uh, for the separation of church and state is not just keeping the church out of government, but keeping the government out of church. And it seems like you embrace sort of the opposite view that by allowing the government to moderate or influence um, religion, that's, that's a good thing. Um, I, I just wonder, sort of, if you could elaborate on that a little bit more, because, I mean, the, the term separation of church and state and the wall between separation of church and state is actually used to justify sort of uh, the First Amendment to Baptists and, 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 and other small religious groups that uh, wanted government to stay out of religion. So I'm wondering why it makes sense to break down those barriers today and, and perhaps engage more in that. That's an excellent question. I'll answer as follows. Um, Law and religion have always had an elaborate dance about what secular society ought to permit in religious communities. And the separation of church and state um, never applies to legal doctrine. So secular society says no polygamy. And the Mormons say, but our religion says polygamy is a good thing, to which secular society says, stop it. <laughs> stop it. And when the Mormons say, but isn't there a wall between church and state? The answer is yes. but it, but we are allowed to regulate your general conduct. Um, your conduct not as a religion, but as a person. Now, the Mormons could have responded by saying, but let me explain to you the virtues of polygamy, and you should reconsider your prohibition against polygamy. To me, what religion contributes isn't, ah, by the way, totally not in favor of polygamy. <laughs> Let the record reflect. Um, uh, particularly since my wife is going to watch the video. Um, <laughs> But, but the wall never applied in situations where you have intellectual discourse about what's the right law. Religions have always advocated a vision of law, and law has always advocated a vision of conduct which impacts on religion. So of course, we don't want government intermeddling too tightly in the runnings of a church, or a church meddling too tightly in the runnings of government. But the idea that a religion will present a vision of what just law looks like which judges will ponder is no different than the fact that secular society will put forward a vision of what just conduct looks like, which religions will ponder. Um, I think that that's obvious. That's the, that's the give and take that occurs in any civilized society between competing intellectual discourses. <clears throat> Physics and chemistry interact with competing visions of truth. Um, law and religion interact with competing <laughs> visions of truth. And they ponder each other's arguments, and they consider them. This heightens that uh, mixture. Does that help? Please. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to thank you again for a really interesting talk that taught me a lot, especially that all of those laws that counties are trying to pass outlawing Sharia law might actually do something. And so I was wondering um, how like counties that are trying to prohibit any recognition of Sharia law would impact the use of religious arbitration and issues like that. So the moment you mention a specific religion, you're flagrantly unconstitutional. The courts have repeatedly struck them down quite correctly. If you want to prohibit um, Sharia law, um, you have to more or less try to prohibit all the law of any uh, jurisdiction. If I wanted to do this, and I don't, but if I were a lawyer representing those who wanted to, I would pass a law which says, States may not enforce any arbitration other than from the law of another state in the United States or the federal government or any nation that's a member of the United Nations. But I'm not sure how well that applies to Sharia law. Because what happens among sophisticated Shariites is they just put in choice of law to Iran. Um, but then you could narrow it further and say there shall only be choice of law in the United States to any state or federal jurisdiction. The problem with that, of course, becomes uh, British insurance law. Um, but you could do a lot to get rid of religious law if you just limited law to any jurisdiction in the United States. But it would have dramatic consequences for lots of commerce. Um, or you could go the route of, uh, let's say, um, Ontario and say there's no arbitration at all of family law matters. 
and allow any robust arbitration of any type, but say all family law matters shall be resolved in accordance with the law of the state of Ontario. If I were to guess um, what the, what the anti-Sharia 3.0 looks like, it's a very narrow targeting. It says we're only going to talk about this in the area of family law, and in family law we're going to make every dispute resolvable according to only the local law of our state. I'm very hostile to that, but I think that's probably constitutional. <coughs> I come from Guatemala, and we have the same discussion with uh, indigenous tribunals. Mm -hmm. And I always put the example of uh, uh, religious uh, tribunals because they they operate actually in Guatemala, especially mm -hmm. the Catholic Church is sure. very important. But uh, why are you against that? That with li limiting um, the criminal subject matter to this kind of tribunals, because uh, for example, for for bringing justice to a community is like really important criminal courts. I agree. I guess in the United States, though, we have a thriving, successful criminal justice system. And the state, I think, reserves a monopoly police power. It would be a much graver breach of the wall between church and state to allow a religious arbitration tribunal to incarcerate somebody or lash somebody or otherwise engage in physical punishment. The, it would, it's a dramatic recasting of the American agreement to allow the privatization of what's historically criminal conduct. In a society where the government fails to enforce the criminal law, it might be that it's a better option to have church law than no law. But in the United States, where there's robust enforcement of criminal law, I hope, um, we wouldn't need that. Does that help? Well, thank you for your talk. It struck me that um, some of what you were talking about pertains to arbitration in general, the issue that it is based on consent. Who can really say that we've consented to, say, the iTunes user agreement? I think it's a similar objection that has someone raised in a church uh, or in a synagogue really given their free consent to the agreement. So my question is, you mentioned excommunication is one potential thing you can do. I would offer you no challenge on that, but for someone who would say it's problematic that religions can call upon an agent of the state to enforce their arbitral awards, how would you react to that sort of so the issue of the bona fide-ness of consent is, is very important. You're right, of course. People get brainwashed by how they grow up to believe in the truth. I was. I tried really hard to brainwash my daughter, Deborah, over there. Um, she's 17. I have one more year left to wash her brain. And then she wants to go to Stanford for college if anybody can help her. Um, that would be appreciated. Um, but I think that the basic answer we give is as follows. These are not contracts of adhesion group signed. These are individualized contracts that people are called upon to sign. And to deny people's ability to consent as adults because they're full faith believers is just a vast diminution of religious liberty. It, it hugely diminishes contract law to deny the ability of a person to individually sign a contract that's put in front of them that's not a contract of adhesion, but it's between two parties. To me, the Apple um, contracts truly are contracts of adhesion because you can't modify them and you can't use the product without it. Everybody knows people leave religious communities over these issues. People say, I will not sign and I'm leaving. Um, people exercise their right to, to take the bus, Russ, as Simon <laughs> and Garfunkel says, and leave their religious community because they don't agree. It just doesn't seem in the real world to be a contract of adhesion because people come and go as they see fit. But I, I don't have a better answer than that, except to say I don't think it looks like a contract of adhesion. It's much less adhesive than the contract you sign um, when you buy something at Target and sign the contract of adhesion. It's much less adhesive um, than many routine computer contracts you sign. Here it's a document negotiated between the parties, frequently with individualized conditions. It doesn't sound like a contract of adhesion. That's the answer, I guess. Thank you. Thanks. So there's a 
doctrine, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that holds and that some court decisions have endorsed that the establishment clause makes courts incompetent to assess certain religious. Values. Yes, sure. So we can't say who's the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Right. We can't say whether he's prime minister for a reason or not. And I'm wondering if that comes up in when people are seeking judicial enforcement of these religious arbitration agreements, when someone says, you didn't follow the religious rules correctly, or that person's not right. the right kind of rabbi, um, if, if courts run into establishment clause problems. Uh, courts in inevitably punt um, when a litigant says they got the Jewish law wrong. Courts are absolutely incapable of resolving the question of, was the religious law correctly adjudicated? There is no substantive review of the ecclesiastical matters at play. What courts can determine is, in New York State, you can't start an arbitration proceeding before 8 a.m. And they can check to make sure that you didn't start before 8 a.m. But they have no ability to determine if I've adjudicated Jewish law correctly, for sure. Sure, but I'm wondering, there must be times when religious doctrines require certain procedural requirements as well. So almost inevitably, my experience has shown me that Jewish, Christian, and Islamic tribunals all modify their procedural rules to accommodate the laws of the state. That's exactly the kind of positive dialogue um, that takes place, which is um, religious tribunals are leadable. If you hold out for them the carrot of enforcement, um, they modify their substantive doctrines in order to get enforcement. Absolutely. How much of your argument is based on religion? Because we now see people talking about morality, mm -hmm. excluding religion. Sure. So isn't your argument complete? Aren't you just using religion as a talking point rather than anything else? That I can sign a contract with Apple and I'm part of their moral community, assuming that they explain it, and then it's a contract. I assign a contract with you as a rabbi, etc. So religion is irrelevant. Question. It, yes, it's an excellent point. Um, but I think that the, the factual answer goes as follows. The communities that are running these tribunals, in fact, are religious communities throughout the United States. And while secular people might look at them through the rubric of the Federal Arbitration Act, Religious communities are using them to build substantive religious values. So a consequence of the kind of neutrality you're putting forward is you're going to reinforce the cohesiveness of religious communities. I don't have a problem with that. I'm even in favor of that. But you're right. You could look at this totally from the rubric of the Federal Arbitration Act and pretend that there is no religion here at play. But the social consequences of this activity, even that approach would acknowledge, is the building of religious communities. Just like you can build an apple community this way. But it, in fact, builds communities that, in its critics' models, are hostile to the norms of secular society. I'm not of that view, neither by Apple nor by Judaism. Um, but I can see some are of that view. With regards to religious arbitration tribunals, how broad is the participation? For example, we have you have um, conservative Jews, you have Orthodox Jews, mm -hmm. more liberal Jews, and you have Black Jews. So, who is enabled to participate within this Jewish tribunal? So, I think the answer goes as follows: anybody who belongs to a faith group that has substantive law doctrine forms a religious tribunal that seeks to enforce their substantive law. So if you belong to a community, Jewish, Christian, Islamic, or whatever, that believes in a substantive legal system other than American law, you will ultimately seek to form a religious arbitration tribunal that gives your law teeth. Because if it's not, um, with, if it does, if it's not enforceable, it's not really in law. So I think the Jewish communities that have firm legal doctrine um, that they perceive as sometimes in disagreement with American law are all doing this. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with the seriousness with which you take your religious doctrine. And this is why the evangelicals, as they're leaving um, American law, but yet have religious doctrines of some substance, are inevitably drawn doctrinally to the same thing. Never mind Islamic law, which has deep substantive rules. So if uh, a black Jew would go before a Jewish tribunal, arbitration tribunal, 
they would be able to. Sure. Sure. Yes, of course. Uh, you mentioned the premarital agreement that you would almost insist on. Uh, Not only. You would insist yeah, on. Yeah, I won't that. perform a marriage without it. So I assume that would require that the couple, if they had a dispute about their divorce or custody, they would go to the religious tribunal? Yeah. And so if, let's say, the, the woman, for example, was a victim of domestic violence and she brought her case to the civil court, would the case likely be bounced back to the religious tribunal? No, because it's a criminal matter. Criminal matters are exempt from arbitration through and through in the United States. Um, no, but if it, let's say she just asked for a civil restraining order, which is... No, civil restraining orders are fundamentally criminal. We're talking here if she asked for money. Or custody. Or custody, depending on what kind of agreement she signs. That's correct. And but a, a restraining order is inherently by its very nature criminal. Even a civil restraining order is by its very nature criminal in the sense that you violate uh, criminal sanctions occur. Uh, if I could just follow up with the, with the custody issues, would the, uh, relig would the civil tribunal say, hey, we're, our, ba our basic rule is the best interest of the child, if they feel that the religious tribunal is not looking at the best interest of the child, but certain other rules that standards in the religious community? They ought to avoid the, arbitra the, the decision of the rabbinical court. This, by the way, is a fascinating example. I'll just give you an interactive example to think about. In Jewish law, there's a dispute between two competing camps with regard to child custody. One school of thought treats child custody as in the best interest of the child, exactly identical to secular court. And another vision of Jewish law treats child custody as parental rights. Oh, well, by the way, not crazy from an American law perspective, but it treats my right to my child as something akin to my right, not necessarily in the best interest of the child always, but my right. Parents have rights to see their children. There's a dispute in Jewish law. Used to be a dispute, by the way, in American law as well, but mostly that dispute is closed now. Um, the rabbinical courts in the United States have uniformly moved to the best interest of the child standard, because if they don't move to that standard, the secular courts won't enforce it. Um, so what you see from this is a give and take about even what substantive Jewish law looks like. Uh, because if you wish to be enforced, if you wish to be enforced, you better obey the rules of enforcement. This intellectual give and take in which you um, watch what's going on uh, around you because you want to not be reversed plays a very important role. There is no child custody adjudication in the United States other than in the best interest of the child because you're wasting your time. And nobody actually really wants to waste their time. This is part of this wonderful give and take. The Jewish tradition has learned something from American law. Um, it doesn't have to, but it in fact wants to, because that give and take is uh, remarkably successful. Any other questions, please? Please. I'll call on you now. You don't have to get up, ma'am. It's OK. Just uh, could you tell us uh, why you insist on a prenup and what's, what's in it? Oh, sure. What's in the prenup is, is that the husband and the wife, Jew, the Jewish tradition doesn't recognize the validity of secular divorce alone. Um, and it requires that there be a Jewish divorce ritual, no different than there be a Jewish marriage ritual. It doesn't recognize uh, secular divorce as legally ending their Jewish marriage. And the prenuptial agreement requires that the parties agree to go through a, a religious divorce on top of or in addition to a secular divorce. That's what the prenup requires. It doesn't actually typically require any adjudication of the substantive disputes between the parties, although sometimes the parties put that in of their own free will. I would not require it. I'm sorry, ma'am, you wanted to ask something. Yes, I did. Is there any aspect of, uh, of U.S. constitutional or other law that how do you know whether the court will look at, for example, you gave the example there custody. How about uh, if you have a religious law that says the man always gets all the property mm -hmm. or, um, or uh, the woman must leave the house and, and the man retains the house. How do you know whether or, or not uh, the court would approve such a, a law, such a religious law? Well, let's just consider this case. Let's imagine not they said Jewish law, but the party signed a prenup 
in which they agreed in case of divorce, the woman shall get no marital property. Would that be a valid prenup? Probably so. Probably so. So why should it be any different if they say, if the parties assigned a prenup in which they agree that since Jewish law said this, we're going to do this. Meaning, in my view here, secular law shouldn't say, because you reach this result for religious reasons, we're not going to enforce it. But if you reach it for secular reasons, then it is. Presumably, a judge won't enforce provisions of an arbitration agreement that the judge finds violative of significant parts of public policy. But um, the fact that I'm, I'm making this order because Jewish law says this probably is of no importance to the judge. We would be very uncomfortable with a decision which says, for example, parents can circumcise their children for medical reasons and not for religious reasons. Either parents are entitled to circumcise their children or they're not. But the motives of the people as they engage in an activity probably beyond the ken of the judge in any way, shape, or form. So it's a prenup. Whatever the prenup says, the prenup says. Judges are very deferential to prenups in the United States in a very fascinating ways that much more substantially curtail rights than anything you would find in Jewish law. But if there isn't a prenup, you've got to have a very specific contract between the parties that's got to, to, to disclose a whole lot. To oh, the now you're asking a much harder question, which is how much of Jewish law do I need to share with you before you agree to be adjudicated according to Jewish law? <laughs> Most courts say as follows. When you sign up to French law, you can't say, I didn't know this about French law. When you sign up to Italian law, you can't be heard to say, I don't know this about Italian law. When you and I have a dispute in California and we agree to be adjudicated according to uh, Georgia law, you can't say, I didn't know this was found in Georgia law. The answer is, when you sign an agreement, you are expected to understand it. When you encounter a word like Jewish law, and you say, gee, what is that? Um, you're supposed to be, uh, be an adult enough to say, I shouldn't sign this, because this looks like an awfully important term, <laughs> and I don't know what it means. So that's the basic answer, which is, I meaning that doctrinal objection would make sense if sort of I wrote Jewish law in you know, a two-size font, or I covered it with a Band-Aid, and I said, you may not rip the Band-Aid off until after you sign the contract. But if I'm above board and honest about what I'm saying to you, if you don't know what it means, get a lawyer who will explain it to you. That's what we do all the time, of course. Of course, you can't say, I signed the contract, I read it closely, I didn't understand it, but I signed it anyway. Uh, if so, all contracts don't work. Okay, please join me again. Thank you.